Hi everybody, I'm Larry Sorensen with F5 Sports, manufacturers of the Pitch Logic Baseball. We're going to be doing a series of baseball chats with a lot of people around the baseball world, professional, college, high school, players, coaches, pitching coaches, a lot of different folks. But today we're really lucky to have Matt Hobbs, the University of Arkansas pitching coach that is going to join us. Uh, I first met Matt about five years ago at Wake Forest University when he was the pitching coach there. And he really introduced me to the world of analytics and what's going on and why the ball does what it does on its way to home plate. We'll talk about that some, but we're also going to talk a lot about knowing your strengths and weaknesses, which is something I always believed in. So stay tuned for this one. It's, you're going to enjoy it. Matt, uh, tell us exactly what you're doing right now uh, with everything that's going on with college baseball and the draft. Uh, what's happening in the Matt Hobbs world right now? Strange times, Larry. Certainly strange times. And first of all, thanks for having me on. Um, I think that like the build up to the draft was that was kind of what we were concerned. We're, first of all, we're trying to figure out what to do with our players when they're remotely training, you know, for the whole entirety of the, the school season. And then when that kind of gets close to the end, we start looking at, all right, now we're approaching the draft now what do we do with the draft who's going to be drafted how many are going to be drafted which returners are going to be drafted which incoming guys <laughs> <laughs> and now it's like now we deal with now that they have been drafted now what do we do with our current roster so yeah. i think it's just a lot of questions that it just it's 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 hard because it's new you know it's just hard because it's new it's just different so i think we're all it's just all, working through. it's also adjusting on the fly it's yeah, it's a moving on the fly like yeah. hourly. Yep, yep. It's a moving target. I mean, and I think that's what you're dealing with in every sport right now is, you know, you depending on which day or which person you listen to, it's it's either the best news you've ever heard or the sky is falling. So <laughs> I think just trying to just stay as like this soon shall pass. Also, we need to make sure that everybody's taken care of, everybody's healthy, everybody's in a safe environment, and if we do that. I think that, you know, at the end of this thing, we'll come back and be pretty proud of the way we handled it. Well, congratulations to Arkansas, by the way, for having the second player taken in the draft. Tell us a little bit about him. Uh, I mean, probably. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of really good offensive players in college baseball. I was really lucky to work with Bill Salento at Wake Forest, who I think is one of the better hitting coaches in the country, and he developed some outstanding players offensively. And then I come here, and the first guy I see in batting practice is Heston Kerstad. And I was like, well, that's just different. <laughs> <laughs> that's just a little bit different. And then he comes, you know, he goes and plays for Team USA in the summer. He has a great year for us last year, helps us get, or two years ago, I guess, helps us get to Omaha for the second straight year and is one of our best hitters, if not our best hitter. And then he goes out in summer and plays for Team USA. And I'm talking with, I was asked to speak at the ABCA convention in September, and I'm talking to Dan McDonald, who is, organizing the speakers who also happened to be the head coach of team USA. And he said, you know what? You guys got something different coming back in curse dad. He's like, it's different than you remember it, you wow. know? And he's like, and I know that you thought it was really good, but it's a lot different now. And then like, we're about two thirds of the way through fall practice and we're all sitting around one day and he's hitting. And it's like, we start looking back to some statistics and we're kind of trying to evaluate our team. We're like, this guy's only swung and missed like three times the entire fall. And that was what he really? did. That was what he struck, had struggled with in the past, was just leaving the zone. And we, I thought we had some pretty good arms. And I was like, God, you know, he just doesn't swing and miss very much. And then it starts to get really difficult to try to navigate him as a hitter. And I think that's when, when I think that a guy's about to have a special season, it's when I'm sitting in the other dugout during an inter squad game and being like, I don't know what to do here. And I remember, <laughs> feeling, <laughs> I remember feeling that way about like Will Craig when yeah. I was at Wake and Stuart Fairchild. Gavin Sheets and some of those like really, really talented offensive players that I've been around in the past and just looking at it like, all right, well, you know, we have really good stuff on the mound, but I'm not a hundred percent sure what, how he's going to get them out. Well, we've only got about a half hour, so I won't tell you list of players. I felt that same way about <laughs> on the mound yeah. saying, oh goodness, what do I throw next? You know, I didn't have to do that. Situation. You know, one of the things you said a minute ago about, uh, about taking things in stride and we'll deal with it. We'll make sure everybody's taken care of. I said to you, and you and I met in 2015, I believe it was, when you first got to Wake yep. Forest. And I have you to blame for all of this analytics stuff that I've become <laughs> involved with, and we'll get to it. But you said, I said to you one time, big game coming up. 
And you said every day should be a big game because you should prepare for it as if all you have to do is go out and do your normal thing. And that stuck yep. with me for a long time. I think that that's, the, that's kind of the way we try to approach everything we do. It's like catch play, your bullpen on Tuesday, you know, your, your short work, your plyo throws, your pre-throw, your post-throw. It shouldn't be any more pressure filled than, you know, pitching in front of 13,000 in Bomb Walker. I mean, I realize there are differences, but if you approach it as if it's the most important thing you're doing right now, it's a lot easier to perform when it starts to get what people would perceive as more important. You know, one of the things that we notice is as we go from game situations and we're tracking analytics and everything else, you can't really simulate that in your bullpen sessions when you're trying to work on things. How do you make those kinds of adjustments as a coach and how do you work your players through that? I think the, the you try to create an environment that's really competitive in the bullpen. And one of the things that we've we, we just track everything we do, so whether it's an, a game, an inner squad, a bullpen, as much as we can with catch play. Um, and then we we put it we put it out there for everybody to see. So if a guy's throwing a bullpen on a Tuesday and he's our Friday starter, you know, the numbers are on the board. It's being tracked. It's being videoed you're getting feedback and then everybody's seeing it happen in real time. So if your guy's going to try to coast through this bullpen throwing 70%, but his teammates are going to see it and he's not going to want to, you know, be perceived as the guy that's not working maybe as hard as everybody else. So it's, it creates a really competitive environment when everybody sees what's going on all the time. And when they know it's being tracked, I think that that's, mm -hmm. I think from a development standpoint, if I'm a pitcher, I don't want to try to compare two different things. I want to try to keep it as close to, I, within reason, as close as I can, so that the feedback is a little bit, the feedback loops a little tighter. What you run into a lot of times is if you're trying to look at a bullpen or a guy's throwing 50 to 75, whatever, whatever the percentage you want to put on it is, and then he's trying to compare that to game data, it just doesn't make any sense. So the closer we can right. get to having at least a, a certain number of pitches we can get that are tracked, that are fairly aggressive in the middle of the week that we can start comparing to some movement profile from a game situation. You know, we can get closer to it. You're never going to get the same because it's just, they're not trying to get people out in their, in their midweek pen. And we all understand that. But if you're comparing pens to pens and outings to outings and games, it's a little bit, it makes a little bit more sense. It's kind of like if you're comparing, you know, a pitcher that you like, let's say you recruited a pitcher and you're comparing him in the fall of his freshman year to the spring of his senior year of high school and you're trying to mm -hmm. figure out, all right, well, what hat, why isn't it the same? You know, why isn't it just making this like gradual progression? And the things you should be comparing it to are the fall of his senior year, not the spring of his senior year. It's like when I'm looking at a pitcher and I'm looking at fall practice compared to spring, you know, I, I look at spring to spring and fall to fall. So fall of his freshman year, interesting. all of his like fall of his sophomore year, are the things you should be comparing, not, spring of his freshman year to fall of his sophomore year and why they're not the same. There's a lot of factors that go into those things. And if you're looking at progression and, and development, it's important that you're looking at things that are very similar. It's like testing. You know, if we're going to test readiness or we're going to try to create a, something to test readiness, it's got to be done exactly the same time, same way every single time so that we have a baseline to deal with. Like if your baseline is a game pitch, you need to compare game pitches to game pitches and bullpens to bullpens if you're going right. to actually try to track development. That makes sense. And what? So since we're talking about timing and seasonally, let's let's take it in season to your pitchers. You're on a seven day rotation with a guy mm -hmm. that's pitching on a weekend. Your Friday, Saturday, Sunday guy. When will they throw their bullpens typically? And do, does that vary individually by what the what the player is? There's a little bit of variance in when they throw their pens. What we usually see is like three days before, basically. So okay. if our, our, Tuesday, our Tuesday bullpen would be for our Friday starter, Wednesday bullpen for Saturday starter, Thursday bullpen okay. for Sunday starter. So we, we operated off that, you know, as long as I've been coaching. Um, you know, probably in the last 10 to 12 years, it's been pretty much that, that situation. There have been guys that have wanted to get up on the mound twice in, twice in a week which I'm mm -hmm. perfectly okay with since we do operate on seven days. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't really change that the, the, the real pregame work is done on Tuesday if you're Friday, Wednesday, right. Saturday. So the real work is done that day in terms of install, if you're talking about game planning, um, and then really getting into like what just – trying to adjust what just happened and prepare for what's about to happen just in terms of 
you know, what's going to go on in the bullpen. It's th- there has to be some, especially in season, some semblance of like, what does Mississippi state have that we have to get ready for? Right. In addition to what just happened against South Carolina that we can fix. See, it, it's a little bit different now because you've got all that video and you've got all that experience of being able to look at and, and have an idea of pitch by pitch, what each hitter on the other team saw during the previous game and games and years, mm-hmm. in fact, that's yeah, gonna, that's going to make a difference too. It does. It does. Um, it's always going to come down to what your guy can do. I think more than anything, it's always going to come down to what your guy's capable of doing, what kind of pitches he can make, where does he, where does he utilize it? How can he access the strike zone with different pitches? But if you can look at a heat map of a hitter and then kind of overlay your heat map of your pitcher on, all right, where does he get his soft, most of his soft contact and where most of this hitter's soft contact produced? And you can start to look for holes and look for areas mm-hmm. that you can attack. May not be his best area to go get a, you know, go get a strike or go get a swing and miss. But if it's something he can locate and something he can execute at a higher, at a high percentage clip, then it's an area we can attack. So I think that with scouting and with, you know, development of technology that's been able to help us out with the, either whether it's a track man portal, whether it's synergy, whether it's, you know, whatever, whatever you're using, I think that it, it gives us a chance to at least give our guys the best opportunity to be prepared. Yeah. When we, uh, when we first talked to you and I stole this line from you many years, about uh, three years or so ago in Wake Forest, when I came over with the pitch logic crew, and uh, came over to show you what the pitch logic baseball could do. And uh, David Rankin, the founder, said, "Well, what are the five biggest problems that you've got as a pitching coach?" <laughs> and your reply was, "I've got 16 sets of five biggest problems." Yep. And I, I think that that's one of the things that I've used a thousand times since that day. <laughs> you know, as we've <laughs> gone along, but identifying strengths and weaknesses to me was always the big part of my game. Know what I had yep. best coming out of the pen and get by with that until I could adjust to the other stuff that I knew would come along. Even I knew my sinker was going to be there eventually if right. I didn't have it starting out, but know what, know your own game first, I guess is kind of the point. I think that the best thing we can do as pitching coaches is make our guys responsible for their stuff, like responsible for what it is, what it should be, and then responsible for what it is on that day, like understanding your stuff on that day. Cause there's going to yeah, be days when you yeah. get three, three inches more of horizontal movement on your slider. And you're going to have to know what that looks like. And there's going to be days when, like you said, early, the sinker is not quite there, but you know, you're going to get it there. You know, the things you need to do to get it there. And then you also understand that if the sinker is not there, you know, is the cutter there? And then can I get yeah. the cutter to be good enough to be able to access the strike zone with the sinker now? later in the outing and then even if the sinker's not good if it's if it's an above average pitch no matter what you know it's an above average pitch you can still use it off of whatever you have in your arsenal that's way above average that day because yeah, there's not going to yeah. be too many days where it's all just bad like you're going to oh, have I don't know very, about that. well you're going to have <laughs> some of those days certainly but you're not going to have days where it's just like there's nothing there and if the, it, on those days you, i mean you're not going to be in the game long enough to get anything good anyway <laughs> Yeah, well, I remember I remember too many days where I would come in from the bullpen to the dugout and uh, and the guys and Sal Bando usually would say, are you ready to go? And I'd say, wait a minute, I got to go in the bathroom and try to find my slider real quick because <laughs> <laughs> you know? it just wasn't there. But you, you talked about the College World Series a little bit. And you showed up at the College World Series with some giants. You had some big arms and that's mm-hmm. been your history. Uh, at Wake Forest, a little bit more developmental with Arkansas, you've had some really big arms. Yeah, you know, we were able to, you know, bring in a, a roster that was that was well equipped and talented last year in Omaha. And, you know, Isaiah Campbell being kind of the guy you look to and Matt Cronin, those two guys that were preseason going to be really good and everybody was excited about them. But, you know, the seasons both of them had, you know, Isaiah going, I think, 12 and one or something along those lines and statistically putting together one of the best seasons in Arkansas history. And then Matt was just so consistent at the back end of the bullpen. You know, he struggled in maybe his first outing of the season in a save situation. And then from there, I don't think he blew another save the rest of the season. I think he had like 13 yeah. or 14 saves. Yeah. And I mean, big stuff. And both guys were, you know, Isaiah was kind of like a low to mid 90s guy. And Matt was like a mid to some days upper 90s guy. And then the bullpen was stacked with guys, you know, Cody Scroggins, Jacob Costi Shock, Kevin Copps. 
you know, and then he had two freshmen and Connor Nolan and Patrick Wicklander that were really talented kids and are really, and obviously they're all still really talented kids, but, you know, just a, there's a lot of firepower that we could turn to in our pen. You know, we could we looked at some track man of a game we threw against uh, Tennessee and both teams. Honestly, both teams. There wasn't a pitch in the game thrown below 92 on either side. That's not fair. That's, yeah, it's, it's not the fair. College, at, the co- at the college level, it isn't. And, you know, we looked from the and then we like got a little bit more granular, like, well, from the sixth to the ninth inning, we didn't throw a bullet below 94. So you, we had that kind of firepower in our pen. And yeah. I think that that's one of the reasons why we were as good as we were in the super regional is because we just, we felt like if we could, even though we lost the middle game of the super to, to old Miss, we felt like if we could get into a three game series, we either would dominate two games or get into a three game series with a team. And we had more bullets than they did in the pen. And, yeah. you know, we, we always felt like that was the strength of last year's and this year's team too, if we'd have, if it had played itself out. It was the same thing. It was really – it was a lot of firepower in the bullpen. Well, hopefully next year we'll look for the same thing, and I know you'll have a good fall. The guy that I think that epitomizes a lot of what you taught me and, and for five year, for four years at Wake Forest, you and I kind of butted heads the first couple of years <laughs> because – you would be telling me about X, Y axis and everything else. And I'd be saying he flattened his wrist. He hung a slider guy, hit the bomb. You lost two to one. Yep. <laughs> and it took yeah. about four years until you made me understand exactly what this stuff was about. And then I met the pitch logic guys who took it to that next level by having all of the, uh, everything come out of the baseball. And so I really started paying mm-hmm. attention, but the guy Parker Dunshee, I want you to talk yeah. about him because I, I know he's a favorite of yours and, and what happened with him during his weight career and how your philosophy and using the analytics really have propelled him to where he was in major league camp this year and will be a big league pitcher probably uh, if not this year, next year. Yeah. Parker was a real interesting case. Cause you know, he was that guy that he, the other team would come back in and no one could figure it out. No one could figure out like, why are we swinging and missing at this 90 mile an hour fastball? Like, why can't we hit it? And it was like the perfect, storm of if you're looking at just analytics it was like carry on his fastball but cut and then a super low vertical approach angle so the ball looked like it was coming in and it looked like it would you know almost kind of was looking as if it would rise to the hitter and you know he got a he pitching from a high slot with backspin with well some side spin but a high slot and a low release height and a low vertical approach angle means you know, those fastballs just aren't, there's just not too many of those pitches. That's, that's the only one I've seen since, before or since. And he could he could access the strike zone at the top of the zone. He could throw to his glove side really effectively. And he had, you know, kind of two different breaking balls that he would use. And it wasn't necessarily on purpose all the time, to be honest. I mean, sometimes they, <laughs> like, they morphed into a curveball when we thought it should have been a slider. And he started throwing this, like, power changeup his senior year which was more like a split. So, you know, he was, for me, it was like, you know, the dream situation because he's got, you have this guy that's been this intense competitor his whole life and kind of like a, you know, bulldog mentality or whatever you want to call it. And he had this unique pitch metric that could get him to, you know, acquire swings and misses with his fastball. And so he could pitch off of it while he didn't throw in with elite velocity. And those guys, there, there are some. There's some of them certainly. There's some of them in the big leagues, which is why I think he's going to be a pretty successful big league pitcher if that ever, if mm-hmm. when that opportunity comes for him. But it, it, you just, it's hard to convince people that a 90, you know, 89 to 92 mile an hour fastball is going to be really good. I remember talking to scouts all that year and the year before when he was drafted by the Cubs in I think the 13th round mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. like, well, it's just not a limit. It's just, I mean, I remember having these conversations. You know, it's just not an elite fastball. Ball. It's not an elite fastball. And I was like, well, if you just look at everything, it, it is pretty unique. <laughs> like the thing that I think the thing in analytics or any any anything that we get into is we we kind of forget that the pitch still has to work. Like it still has to beat the barrel. Like it still has to get swings and misses. And yeah. earlier in my career, you know, I would say my first year at Wake Forest, which is kind of some stuff you're talking about, is I was just I was in love with, well, it looks good, you know the video looks good and the analytics and the metrics look good. So the pitch is just going to work, but then it wouldn't perform against the barrel. So it didn't matter. So I'd say probably like middle of my second year awake, I kind of stopped looking as much about, all right, well, here's what the pitch is doing. I mean, I could, I could explain what the pitch was doing, but it only really mattered 
what it did against the barrel. Like how did it perform mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. games? And I think that if we all start to work backwards from stuff like that, or if we're working backwards from this pitch has to perform, this pitch has to be able to create soft contact. It has to be able to create swings and misses. It has to be able to create, you know, optimal launch angles. It has to be able to create those things from us on a pitching side, either launch angles that are super negative, really negative, or obviously very high to create outs. Unless it's producing those things, it doesn't matter really what the pitch is doing. Like it doesn't matter if it's moving the way that we think it should be yeah. moving or if it's got yeah. like a higher induced vertical break or whatever, whatever metric you're looking at. What matters is how it performs. So if we can look at the metrics together, if we can look at more performance based metrics and result, you know, result in outcomes and then try to work backwards from those as all right, what are we trying to achieve with this pitch? Is this going to be a pitch that we use to get swings and misses? Is this going to be a pitch that we're trying to get ground balls with? Is this mm -hmm. going to be a pitch? We're mm -hmm. just trying to access the strike zone with it. Doesn't really matter. We just need something we can get over for a strike so that we can po possibly play up the other elements of this person's arsenal. But the things that matter are performance. And you know, everybody wants to talk about how it really only matters if you work hard, and all, which is true. You got to work hard to do all those things. But the pitch still has to get people out. It still has to perform. Yeah. And the line's only about oh, 150 years old, but the hitter will let you know how you're throwing. No doubt. And it's like, it's still true. Like things that and we were, I was, I'm on a kind of a weekly zoom call with a bunch of really, really good pitching coaches, I think. And that's the thing we always come back to is we were all doing some things that worked 15 years ago. And now that we have all these analytics that are, they're very helpful, but they certainly don't make you or break you as a coach. They don't make you, they give you more access to information, which helps you become a better coach, but they're not going to make you, they're not going to make you be able to help a pitcher figure out how to get people out. Like they're not going to make you be able to do those things. They're going to help, but, but you got to rely on the things that you've been able to do as a pitching coach for years to, to help guys, not just because you have TrackMan now, or you got any of these things, but the, the analytics certainly do lead you down the right path. So you talked about, pitch logic a little bit at the ABCA mm -hmm. uh, coaches convention and there's one on the way to you by the way so you can <laughs> greatly take appreciate a look at that it. and uh, but measuring some of the some of the things that go into an everyday approach maybe for somebody that doesn't have the kind of experience because we got a whole lot of different people that are going to watch this mm -hmm. and guys maybe high school guys that are just getting started into it where would you start I think you're, you're looking you're for, looking at it you're looking for something that's an outlier like you're looking for something in the in the arsenal that can become an outlier, whether it's extreme extreme numbers of something that result in strikes at the plate. Because those are the things that are the most important, or command, or a pitch that you can really throw for you can really act, move around the strike zone. Like for example, if you're throwing with a vertical break that's you know 20 plus inches and you're able to throw it in the zone, you probably have something pretty special. Or if you're able to, you know, use a pitch that has horizontal movement in the 15 to 17 inch range, which is basically the length of the plate. Yeah, it's the width <laughs> of the plate, 17 right. inches, right? And you can throw it for a glove for called glove strikes. You've got something. Um, I think that just trying to either create something unique or or discover something unique is the first place that that I would look. And then your ability to consistently throw those unique those unique characteristics over time. So let's just talk about like the pitch moving vertically. If it's a vertical break fastball, if it's a low horizontal break, high vertical break fastball, being able to replicate that movement over time. I think mm -hmm. that that's where people fall in love with, well, it's really repeatable delivery. Well, there is no such thing as a delivery that repeats itself 50 times in a row. There is not <laughs> like not even close. Like they're they're They don't, you try to write your name 50 straight times and see what happens. Exactly. Exactly. But, but you can create similar movement profiles on the pitch 50 straight times. Like that's the important stuff. Like being able to make the ball do something consistent over time, consistently be able to move the ball over time. So it's not, you're getting mm -hmm. these wide gaps and variants of movement. You're, you're getting pretty tight windows of movement that you know, you can create on a pitch. If I'm a pitcher and I know that I'm going to be able to create high vertical break on my fastball consistently, that gives me more confidence as a pitcher because now I know I've got something unique. I know that I can access the strike zone with it. I know that it's going to produce an outcome that I'm trying to chase on the mound. I'm trying to create an outcome of swings and misses, or I'm trying to create an outcome of soft contact, or I'm trying to create mm -hmm. fly balls, or I'm trying to create ground balls, like whatever you're, you're talking about. And I know that I've got a pitch that can help me do that. 
I'm going to be way more confident than if I'm just out there like, what do I do? How do I do it? What am I supposed to throw? How do I you know, get this guy out? Whatever it is. If I know that I've got something that's unique to me, something that I've either developed or I just have, and I can consistently repeat it over time, and I know that it's going to show up on the majority of the days, whether it's, you know, it might not be as quite as high a vertical break, it might, the command might not be as good, but I know I've got this weapon that I can use. Yeah. I am going to go out there armed with a ton of confidence. And so we circle right back to know your strengths and weaknesses. No doubt. It helps. It does and- help you. It, no question. And the and the other thing that I that I heard you talk about a lot for four years was uh, conviction. Mm-hmm. Conviction in that. Yeah, I think that that's what gives somebody conviction is usually success. Be able to throw something with conviction because they know that it's been successful in the past. As the pitching coach, if I can give our pitchers or whoever I work with an, an idea of what they have that's successful whether it's a breaking ball, change up, whatever the pitch is, doesn't matter. Part of the zone, you know, maybe it's using a different pitch in a different part of the zone because they don't have access to a fastball that can get to the glove side. Maybe it's now they have to throw a cutter, but they have conviction that that cutter is a really good pitch and they can get it over there consistently. Yeah. Um, now, like when you're, when you're asking a pitcher to do something, when I'm asking a, a guy to throw 10 straight glove side fastballs that are going in, if I'm right, you know, right-handed pitcher going into lefties, and they know, like, look, this is a pitch that I make really well. This is a pitch that, you know, we've looked at metrically that's very good. Yeah. And I've had six, some success with this pitch in the past. They're much more likely to throw the pitch with a ton of conviction because they believe it. And when you're talking, I think most of the time when people talk about pitch metrics, they're using it to say that somebody needs to change and now I can prove why he should change. Well, you don't have to look at things that way at all. Like, you can just show somebody okay. why it's really good. Like you don't have to talk, like, well, you need to change because of this. Well, I think that we, we go in so negative sometimes as coaches because we see things we don't like. Well, why don't we show them what we do like and make them understand, like, these are really good pitches. Like you're, sometimes you're convincing a guy that thinks a pitch is not good, that it's great. And I think that those things are, are wildly overlooked. I, I think that's a great point because it seems to me I see a lot of guys with a pitch that's really good that says, yeah, but it's spinning at this or it's doing that. And I think I can make it better if I take it up X amount of RPMs or whatever. And they really take away from the pitch by trying to change it. And if, if, I'm, if my sinker is good at 95, just think of what it'll be at 97. Doesn't always play. You know, I've coached plenty of guys that have had, like you're talking about sinkers, just for example. And this, I think this is, this will kind of piggyback on your point is it's an 89 mile an hour sinker and it's, you know, it's got everything that you'd look for in a, in a fastball that has some sink. It's got, it's performing like a sinker. It's a good pitch. And now they're like, well, if I throw it 94, you know, I'll, you know, I'll probably be a big leaguer. And, you know, if they're, they're right. If they can get the pitch to look, to mirror the movement at 89 at 94, they're going to be more successful. Velocity is the easiest way to, to make any kind of a you know positive change. But if the pitch now flattens out and it's going to ride through the bottom of the zone instead of sink, now it gets hit. Yeah. And now you're just chasing this pitch that you already had that was already very successful. So, you know, when I look at things like, you know, trying to take a pitch from one, one space to another, you have to weigh the pros and the cons of it first, but you also have to, is the pitch a good pitch? Or does it perform? Because in, in those situations, and, and it, when, when I'm talking about these things, I'm dealing with guys that have the ability to be pros. Like there's, we have a, if we have a roster of 20 sure. pitchers, all 20 of them have an ability to be a professional in some capacity. Whether stuff. that's, yeah, they have stuff. enough stuff. They have enough stuff to be a professional. So my job is to make them have the ability to access every one of those pitches. And then through the weight room, through, throwing and conditioning through just overall maturity and development, the stuff's going to get better for the, mo- for the majority of the guys. So just looking at a guy and saying, well, yeah, you know, the sinker is 89 as your fre- in your freshman year. Let's, let's try to like throw some weighted balls and get it to be 95. Like that doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Yeah, like you're yeah, going to have, yeah. this is not a sprint, like the pitching development, hitting development. It's not a sprint. Like it's a long process. <laughs> and if you're looking for these, you know, go to Arkansas or, you know, wherever, and you're going to start throwing 10 miles an hour harder. That's not going to happen at a lot yeah. of places. It's not, I mean, I've seen it happen like three times in my career where it's like immediately you do one thing with the guy and then all of a sudden it's like, he's way better. 
you just don't see that very often. It's usually like six months, eight months, you know, 18 months. And I remember having this conversation, um, I believe it was with probably with, yeah, with coach Walter when I was at wake and he's like, Hey, what do you think of this guy? And I was like, he's 18 months away <laughs> and really believing it. When I, like he's 18 months from helping us, but he's going to help us a lot in 18 months. After and that 18 was months. Yeah. Griffin Roberts. <laughs> like, like you look at him as a freshman, you're like, he's 18 months away from pitching for us in any, in any, sp yeah. in any kind of capacity where he's going to be any good. And, you know, he just, he needed time more than he needed anything time to grow up, time to get stronger, time to you know develop his arsenal. But if you're patient with guys, sometimes you, you get the payoff. And that's just about what it was his sophomore year as a closer. And, uh, yeah. and then he came up with a slider that, uh, just a put away slide, absolute nasty put away slider. And, yeah. Man, uh, I mean, that's what that he always, he, he always had the shape of the pitch. Like that pitch, the shape of that pitch is no different than it was when he was, you know, when he was a, a high school senior, but he was throwing the pitch at 76. And now, you know, you fast forward to the middle of the sophomore year, he's throwing it at 86. Yeah. And yeah. so every part of the pitch is better, but it didn't happen like right away. Like it took a lot of time. And if you look at even like Isaiah Campbell, who we had here last year, like it was a, th I mean, he had some injuries that he had to deal with or like, you know, some, some setbacks, but he would, he was supposed to, in everybody's mind, he was probably supposed to be 12 and one his freshman year. Mm -hmm. And it didn't happen until he was a redshirt junior where he was 12 and one. And he finally like accesses all these tools. And if you, you can look at a lot of guys like that, that it's just, sometimes it's, they're not all, you know, serious dudes when they're freshmen. Well, and if, especially when you go to the younger ages, when you go to the low mid to low mm -hmm. teens and people are saying, well, can you, can you teach my son to throw 10 miles per hour harder? And I say, I guarantee you that I can, if you give him to me for two to three years, 15 yeah. pounds and six inches, I guarantee you he'll throw 10 miles We're per hour harder. The best, the low hanging fruit is gain weight, get stronger and do things consistently. Like it's the low hanging fruit for like every pitcher, like find out what kind of movement profile the pitcher has yeah. and then find out, you know, how to help him uh, move functionally better, how to get him stronger. And that's like any of these kids from the ages of 15 to, 20, to really 15 to 20 years old, that's the low hanging fruit for them. And if you just, do that stuff before you try to do all the other stuff. It's like trying to, you know, squat 315 before you can execute a, you know, a body weight back squat. Like it doesn't, yeah. like it doesn't make a ton of sense to me. It's like, you got to be able to do the, uh, do the really menial, really boring stuff really well first before you start getting, you know, into grips on pitches. So it's why we see like tons of variants. And if I go scout a tournament, you know, God willing, I can scout one in August. If I go scout a tournament and I watch a kid on a Friday or like on a Wednesday and he's 87 and 91 and I'm really excited about him. It's a clean delivery. And I go back and see him again the following week and it's 83 to 85 and it's choppy. And, you know, there's a lot of stuff that kids just don't do from a training standpoint. They don't, mm -hmm. you know, they, they probably don't eat right over the seven day window. They're traveling. They probably don't sleep enough. They probably aren't doing enough movement prep before they get loose. They're probably not doing a bunch of stuff. So I think that if guys can just get on something consistent, if they can understand how their body is supposed to be moving as they descend the mound and they can get stronger, like there's your, there's your window of opportunity yeah. to get better. But it, it also circles us back to something you said right at the top of this conversation. And we'll let you go here in a second, but it, it travels back to, um, track everything and have mm -hmm. establish your baselines monitor your baselines know what you're doing every time that you go out there and are making those improvements along the way gradually know where you came from have an idea where you want to go and track everything you do to get there the best advice i ever got as a coach was write everything down write everything down everything you do like every year from just me personally i take what i've done and i pretty much set it on fire and then start over. I take like three or four days after the season's over when I'm on the road recruiting. Um, I take the time that I usually be, you know, decompressing in my hotel when I get back and I just burn down mm -hmm. my entire program, I burn it to the ground. 
and just start completely over from ground zero about what I liked and what I didn't like. And I think that as a pitcher, you have to kind of do some of those things too. You have to know what you're good at, but you have to be willing to look at, here's everything I did over the last 12 months. Here's where I was at the beginning and here's where I am at the end. And what are the things that helped and what are the things that hurt? Because as, as even from a coach, as a coach or as a player, or as anything, as, as a business owner, you're going to do things that do not work for you because you think they're good mm-hmm. ideas. Mm-hmm. And if you don't know what you've already tried, you don't know like what's already worked for you know one of your pitchers or as a pitcher, what's already worked for you. You're just going to be guessing all the time and just falling into the trap of, well, it's new, so I'm going to do it. Or it's this, so I'm going to try it. Or he tried it, so I'm going to try it. Like, there's there ha- has to be some kind of pretty meticulous strategy for you as a player and a coach to try to get it better. And, you know, I got the idea from my mom was a teacher and she said she did that. That's what she used to do with lesson plans. She would just burn it down at Mm -hmm. the end of the year and start over. And I was like, one, that's crazy. And that's too much work. And two, why would I do that? You know, you're a successful teacher. Why would you do that? And it wasn't until I started coaching where I was like, oh, this makes a ton of sense. Like, you have to, you, you have, you have to do it. Yeah. And it's, it's not failure. It's eliminating possibilities is what yeah. it is. Yeah. And, and if you're using the pitch logic baseball, it's just hit, get report and it comes right back to you in that file. Right. And that's great advice, it, Matt. The whole, it the is, whole conversation's the pitch, outstanding. The pitch logic baseball is I think one of the, and I'm not trying to, you know, stump for pitch logic here, but I just think, from seeing where it where it started to where it currently is, it, what a fantastic piece of feedback for for players, for coaches, for parents. I think it's a really really good piece of equipment. And you know, if you're trying to get better and you're you're in an environment where you know either you're coaching or you're playing and you, you don't have a ton of feedback, you have this opportunity with this ball that's going to be as good as anything that's out there, really. Yeah, and we got to get together with you and show you what's coming next because it's really exciting. I believe always it. great, always great talking with you. Appreciate the time and catching up with you again. Hope to see you before uh, the next coaches convention. Uh, hopefully, we'll run into you maybe at a tournament somewhere along the summer as baseball gets back going. Uh, good luck to you and to Marta and everybody down there in Arkansas. And thanks for joining us today. You bet, Larry. Thank you very much for having me on. And say hello to David for me. We'll do that. All right. See That's you. Matt Hobbs. Great information. Thanks for joining us, everybody. We'll be back with a lot of these different kinds of interviews. We'll have some pro guys in. We'll have more college coaches. We'll get some high school guys mixed in. We'll talk to some of the people involved with Pitch Logic. But we're going to have a lot, of, a lot more of these interviews coming up through the course of the summer, the fall, the winter, the spring. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day.